many ways, John Crow Ransom is considered the father of new criticism. And this is the essay that is in front of you uh, that launches that discussion. Also his book, which was also call, called New Criticism, is when a, when a scholar of his stature takes it upon himself um, to start streamlining the debates of new criticism, right? So today's topic then is to discuss John Crow Ransom's essay, Criticism Incorporated. And uh, what I will do is I will put the essay on the screen and maybe go line by line and see you know, what you think about it. But the whole idea is to read it carefully because there are certain claims that he's making in the beginning for which I already had posted a video which exists, right? Which generally explains what his argument is. But I think it is also important to see who is he referring to and where does he take us at the end? So I'm hoping that you guys will have some good questions, but that's kind of how I hope to do this. Now, if you look at the essay itself, you know, the essay has several parts, right? So the first part, of course, is already kind of setting us up for the debate, right? Where he's arguing that it is kind of strange that there are three different constituencies who try to explain literature to us. But none of them has any form of specialized knowledge or vocabularies. So, for example, he says there are three sorts of trained performers who would appear to have come of the com competence of the critic needs. The first is the artist himself. He should know good art when he sees it. But his understanding is intuitive, and we will dwell on it a little bit. The second is the philosopher who should know all about the functions of the fine arts. But the philosopher is apt to see a lot of wood and no trees. And the third one is the professor of literature uh, from whom you will expect, you know, literary criticism. And then he goes on to explain why they are not doing it, or if they are doing it, why are they doing it wrong? Uh, now, so much of it is kind of also a debate about academic departments and the politics of the entrenched hierarchy. And what does it take to break it, right? And then also is, there is a reference there, and I'll get to it in a minute, is uh, if, if we are misguided as scholars about what constitute criticism, then we are not just harming ourselves and our work. What we are also doing is forcing our students to encounter literature the way we expect them to encounter it. And in the process, either lose them or kind of shape them into something that is not entirely a specialized work of a literary critic. And this is this was written, I think, about 50 years ago or more than that. And imagine we are still there in so many ways, in so many departments. There are always entrenched hier hierarchies in a department. There are always powerful professors who think they have knowledge of how to do literary criticism. And when you encounter them as a, as a junior colleague or as a student, then they try to encourage you to do scholarship a certain way. So the politics of the academia are kind of the same, only we are at a point where, in my opinion, we have reached back into the time where he is. And we are now kind of doing the kind of scholarship which he didn't want the literary critics to do. OK. So I'm looking for any questions uh, while I go over this paragraph about the professors. 
Okay. So it says, nevertheless, it is from the professors of literature in this country, the professors of English for the most part, that I should hope eventually for the erection of intelligent standards of criticism. It is their business. Criticism must become more scientific or precise and systematic. And this means it must be developed by the collective and sustained effort of learned persons, which means that its proper seat is in the universities. OK, cool. So first postulate, in a way, is that criticism must become scientific. We'll, he'll go into that. And that the professor, the professoriate, is the ideal constituency that can do that, right? And that they should take up this responsibility of doing that, right? Next, he further qualifies scientific, but I do not think we need be afraid that criticism trying to be a sort of science will inevitably fall and give up in despair or else fall without realizing it and enjoy some hollow and pretentious career. It will never be a very exact science or even a nearly exact one. But neither will psychology if that term continues to refer to psychic rather than physical phenomena. Nor will sociology, as Pareto, quite contrary to his intentions, appears to have furnished us with evidence for believing. Nor even will economic. OK, so the, 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 that reference is kind of a coded reference. And you have to uh, keep that in mind. Uh, so what he's referring to is Wilfred Pareto, right, who worked at a university, of course, but he's the one who scientificized economics, right? So before him, we have Adam Smith, the great philosopher of economy. But uh, Smith never taught at a university. He didn't do uh, quantitative research, right? And what what Pareto does, right? Wilfredo Pareto does is he gives us a science of economics, right? So what he's saying is that, okay, maybe there is a fear that if we make it, make literary criticism too institutional, that it would become, what I don't know, less palatable but that it needs that scientificity. And there are no other social sciences or humanities that don't have established practices of how to do their work, right? So what he's trying to then advocate for, in my opinion, is that criticism must be performed by professionals. And where do we find those professionals? In the universities, because they have what they call the English departments. And if we have them in the universities, then they must take it upon themselves to develop a scientific method of studying literary texts. Now, not an exact science, but a method, right? Just like scholars and professors in other fields, sociology, mathematics, economics have already been doing. They don't go, the economists don't go to the Department of Political Science and say, let me read your text so that I can make my, no, they have developed their own science of studying it. That's what he is referring to. So, so let's go to what questions do you have? So there is Levy. At the beginning of the essay, he notes that best critics of poems are the poets themselves. This, no, I mean, that's not he's saying you should read the whole paragraph. What he's saying is that there are three constituencies, three groups that claim to have some kind of degree of understanding of criticism. And we could say they could be the poets themselves and the philosophers. And the third is the professors. 
the reason he's saying the poets cannot really be literary critics is that one, their understanding of the poem is intuitive. They wrote it, right? But when they talk about it, they will talk about just the technical details of it. Here is a sonnet. This is how it becomes a sonnet. This is what I was trying to do. And hence, it cannot be considered scientific study of a poem. About the philosophers, his argument is that the philosophers are, you know, they, they focus on bigger fundamental questions. Remember the sentence there is that they would they would see the forest but not the trees. So there is, they lack specificity, right? And so hence they can also not be considered literary critics and, I, and also they are not in the English department. So who is it who teaches literature, talks about it, and also writes about it, the professors of English. So that's why he says that I'm using this term, even though it's not really uh, a very elevated term, that they must become criticism limited or criticism incorporated. But in both cases, what it means is, uh, is how do you incorporate an entity, right? If you wanted to make an incorporation of all the critics, then what you're saying is it must have a body of rules. It must have certain guiding principles with which it governs itself. And it must be the rules that everyone follows. So they must not be, be individual. That's why in the next page, he's making a distinction between criticism and literature appreciation. The distinction that he's making is that is the appreciation is private. Aesthetic appreciation is private because a person has his or her own views of what is beautiful, even if it is informed by poetics or Aristotle. But that's a personal view, personal evaluation. Criticism has to be scientific, but it also has to be public, right? It has to be something that is accepted in the wider domain of critics and uses vocabularies developed not by a private individual, but someone who is part of a larger incorporated group, and that is the professors of literature. Good. So can you explain the definition of historical versus critical? I'm still a little unclear. OK, so here is the distinction. And uh, he goes to it. Let me see on which page. I'll, I'll pull it up here. OK, the historical scholarship that he's talking about, there are two schools that he refers to, right? Uh, the Neo-Aristotelians and the Neo-Humanists, right? And what he's saying about historical scholarship, that is a, let's say, a, not a school, but a group of critics who would read, let's say you want to teach Chaucer, okay? So they will read either the larger history within which Chaucer was producing literature, and it was considered crucial to know that history to understand Chaucer. And then maybe if they want to be a little more specific, they will read the autobiographical informations about the author, and then locate those biographical instances within a poem or within an essay. That is what he's considering historical scholarship. Now, historians, the way they did criticism of any work is they would place it within a historical trajectory. And what they also tended to do was they would pick up what other historians have said about the same work, and then they will make their own historical claims. What he is suggesting is that that will not work for literature because the project of literary criticism is to study the object, which is literature, which is a poem itself. So we are moving into the text, right? And the humanist or the neo-humanist school <clears throat> is not going to work because their approach is moralistic, right? And the Aristotelians, neo-Aristotelians, of which Crane was a member, 
they will not work because their approach is purely aesthetic. <coughs> what is needed is something that doesn't involve the critic's own subjectivity, which is objective, <coughs> and which deals with the object of study itself, but with a scientific method. So in part four is where he kind of outlines what could be this method, right? And that's, that is important to know because he is basically telling us that there are certain things that must be excluded from the work of criticism. And I don't know, do I have it? So the passage before that in, on page nine, 908, <coughs> excuse me, to those who are aesthetically minding, minded among students, the rewards of many a historical labor will have to be disproportionately slight. The official Chaucer course is probably over 95% historical and linguistic and less than 5% aesthetic or critical. A thing of beauty is a joy forever, that's from Keats, but it is not improved because the student has had to tie his tongue before it. It is an artistic object with a heroic human labor behind it. And on these terms, it calls for public discussion. The dialectical possibilities are limitless. And when we begin to realize them, we are engaged in criticism. So the aesthetic appraisal of a text, since it is a private experience in his way, doesn't do justice to the text itself, but also it kind of hampers an eager graduate student, you know, who wants to say something critically and publicly about the text. So remember, Criticism has to be public. It has to be part of a public debate. So what he's saying is that even if you approach literary studies, even if you come to English studies and say, I'm here to learn to do art appreciation, I'm here to enjoy literature. If you go through a formal course on any poet, his example is Chaucer, before you even get to that, enjoying it or appreciating it in a private manner, you have to deal with all the historical elements and everything else that the professor has packed into the course. And that's what he's saying. So when do we get to the criticism, right? So in the next paragraph then, or part four of the essay, he tells us what not to do. So what is criticism? Easier to ask. What is criticism not? It is an act now notoriously arbitrary and undefined. We feel certain that the critical act is not one of those which the professors of literature habitually perform and cause their students to perform. And it is our melancholy impression that it is not often cleanly performed in those loose compositions by writers of perfectly indeterminate qualifications that appear in print as reviews of books. So what he's saying is that what is being proffered as criticism by professors as historical autobiographical criticism is not necessarily criticism. And what is being offered by the reviewers in the newspapers and magazines is also not criticism. And then he's referring to Crane. Right, Professor Crane. He was the University of Chicago professor who eventually came to be called as uh, Neo-Aristotelians because they relied somewhat on poetics and on rhetoric, but they themselves hated that term. They didn't like it. But he's the one who develops as the head of the department at University of Chicago, a new kind of curriculum on great books and tries to devise a scientific method of reading the text. Now remember, University of Chicago then wasn't really an established Ivy League school that it is now, right? So what 
Crane is also saying is that because he has gone and done that, he has launched this new movement of and, and has other professors who have joined him, has brought this school to the fore as a school where people do want to go and study, right? So part of creating an incorporated critical repertoire for a department is that it needs the masters in the department to buy into it, to create it, and to have an incorporated faculty that does it but the long-term gain for a university is that it will become prominent for that and people will come and study. And that's what University of Chicago becomes in so many ways. But he is writing in that moment. So, uh, but more exclusions are possible. So he's saying he, he excludes neo-humanism. The leftists are already include, excluded uh, because they talk about not the work of art itself, but class struggle intentions of the proletariat within a text. So what he's saying is here are a few other things that we can exclude if we are to develop an incorporate system of public criticism, right? And these are some exclusions. He gives you six inclusions, exclusions from fall. First exclusion is personal registrations. Who can explain it to me? I mean, I can read it a little bit, but uh, which are declare, declarations of the effect of the artwork upon the critic as a reader. So what he's saying is that what we must exclude from any work of criticism is the effect. So all those vocabularies that critics used, and he refers to them here, moving, exciting, entertaining, pitiful, great, Anything that has to do with how the work moved a reader or impacted a reader or made them think must be excluded. Now think of it, how prescient that is. Where do we find this um, kind of language right? in contemporary work? How many of you have ever read a blurb on a novel, right? What does it say? Moving, superb, lucid. All of those refer to what the novel feels like when the reviewer read it, right? But it also presupposes that the value of the novel is from its impact and the impact on the reader. So what he's saying is these kind of personal registrations, especially emotional, right, must be excluded from this synopsis and paraphrase. The high school classes and the women's clubs delight in these procedures. See how he, I mean, look at this, that. I mean, the sexism of his uh, women are categorized right next to high school students, um, which are easiest of all the systemic exercises possible in the discussion of literary objects. I do not mean that the critic never uses them in his analysis of fiction and poetry. This is crucial. This is where Cleanth Brooks will come in, okay, to challenge these assumptions. But he does not consider plot or story as identical with the real content. Plot is an abstract from content. Number third exclusion then is historical studies. These have a very wide range and include studies of the general literary background, author's biography, of course, with special reference to autobiographical evidences in the work itself, bibliographical items, the citations of literary originals and analogs, and therefore what in general is called comparative literature. Nothing can be more stimulating to critical analysis than comparative literature, but it may be conducted only superficially. If the comparisons are perfunctory and mechanical, or if the scholar is content with merely making the parallel citations, right? So excluded also are these deep historical studies where people would claim that you can't really understand a poem unless you have the wider historical knowledge or the deeper historical knowledge of its own context or certain autobiographical details of the author himself. These are also, this is kind of the third exclusion. Four, linguistic studies. 
Under this head come those studies which define the meaning of unusual words and idioms, including the foreign and archaic ones and identify the allusions. The total benefit of linguistics for criticism would be the assurance that the letter was based on perfect logical understanding of the content or interpretation. Acquaintance with all the languages and literatures in the world would not necessarily produce a critic, though it might save one from damaging errors. Okay. So this is, so these critiques then are refer, not just coming out of random. The first one, exclusion of personal registrations, right, is the kind of criticism that was seen in book reviews and others. I read this book and it brought me to tears, right? And it's also a critique of who? Aristotle, right? The role that he assigns to tragedy, right, in poetics, right? Is that, or, or people who claim that poetry has a cathartic impact. So those schools of thought, people who write with that knowledge are excluded because personal registrations are excluded. Synopsis and paraphrase, that excludes the so-called dilettante groups, you know, who sit and say, here is what the novel is about and here is what we are going to discuss. Those are excluded. Historical studies, the moment you mention that, then departments of history and historians are excluded. So th there is more at play here, right? Not just simple terms. The moment he goes to linguistic studies, any reliance on philology and everything else to do criticism or on this idea that by knowing more of the language, we can study the object of study better. So it takes the linguistics out, which are also established departments, right? And then moral studies, right? My people, right? Um, the moral standard applied is the one appropriate to the reviewer. It may be the Christian ethic or the Aristotelian one or the new proletarian gospel. But the moral content is not the whole content, which should never be relinquished, right? So yeah, talk about a little bit about the moral content, but do not reduce a poem or reading of it to a reading in, in morality, right? Doesn't matter which point of view, you come from. So that excludes the Marxists, right? That excludes uh, any attempts at doing Christian or religious readings of the text. And that is the fifth inclusion. And the sixth, any other special studies which deals with some abstract or prose content taken out of the work, nearly all departments of knowledge may conceivably find their own materials in literature and take them out. Studies have been made of Chaucer's command of medieval sciences, of Spencer's view of the Irish question, of Shakespeare's understanding of the law, of Milton's geography, of Hardy's place names. The critic may well inform himself of these materials as possessed by the artist, but his business as critic is to discuss the literary assimilation of them. So anything that abstracts from a work of art and then makes a study out of it, I am going to read uh, representations of slaves in Chaucer or historical part or moral tales within it. He is saying, nah, you can inform yourself that that's what Hardy did when he named his places or Faulkner, Yoknapatawa County is named after this. This is where he lived, but you can't abstract it out of it and make it a subject of your criticism because then you're abstracting history out of it. You're abstracting philosophy out of it. You're extracting class struggle out of it. The work of art is still there. Even though, but you can incorporate in your thinking as a critic that all these things inform the text and be informed about it. Uh, okay. Questions, uh, he makes clear that peripheral studies such as Chaucer's command of medieval sciences are fine, but it's the critics business to discuss this. Yes, peripheral in a sense that they cannot be abstracted and made into an object of critical study in itself, right? But the critic can mention while reading a poem. 
that, hey, okay, Chaucer was also informed by this. But building a whole critical um, essay or a book about those peripherals, what he calls, is not what he would consider criticism. So, so in order to define what criticism is, then here are the six exclusions that he gives us. Now, keep in mind, this is one of the most powerful critics of his time. He is literally launching here the movement called New Criticism. He, he, he has already, and then he, he will go on to publish a book called New Criticism. So this is not he writing in a vacuum. He has an audience. He has colleagues with whom he has worked, right? Cleanth Brooks, right? Um, and others. And so this will immediately become a debate. And this will become such a powerful debate that it will eventually launch a school called New Criticism. But these six things that he's mentioning here, in one way or the other, even though people will challenge them here and there, will kind of become the guiding principles of New Criticism, right? Don't mention the author, right? Uh, don't mention your own feelings. We will read those essays, right? Intentional fallacy, affective fallacy, right? Uh, don't look at the moral aspects of a poem. You know, uh, don't give what it does to you or how does it make you feel, right? All of these things will become part of what we consider new criticism. Not necessarily historicism. What he's saying is that, okay, you cannot make a study of, oh, Chaucer was very well known, well known for his knowledge of archery and then make a study out of that. But you can mention that this was a little bit that he knew. Now, how does he assimilate that knowledge into a poem or into his art? Similarly, let's say, instead of writing a treatise on Shakespeare's understanding of Roman law, right? And writing an essay, well, Shakespeare studied this and he had these, these books in his library and the such and such pages earmarked. So I'm gonna write about a book that Shakespeare uh, knew law. That is one way in which he would not permit. But you can see, you can say it's Shakespeare's knowledge of the law and here is how stylistically in a play it is operated, right? Well, let me give you an example, okay? Uh, the Tempest, right? There is a scene in The Tempest where what is the character's name? The one who's a philosopher and another one is talking about, or not even, don't even go there. Shakespeare's understanding of the law, right? How is it assimilated into a play? It's that dialogue between Caliban and Prosper, right? What does he say to him? And I, I don't remember the dialogue. My wife would remember it, right? Uh, where he says, this island where you are standing was left to me my, by my mother, Sycorax. That is he laying claim to the island through inheritance, right? Two, when you came here, you didn't know poison from the edible berries. I showed you that. Now that's an understanding of the obligations of hospitality, right? But Caliban, who is considered traditionally an animalistic figure, by some very prominent scholars, right? Um, Harold Bloom called him a coward, right? In one of his essays, he says, and because of these feminists and post-colonialists, a coward like Caliban has become a hero. But my point against that was that within the text, there is no place in the text where Caliban is an animal, right? Because that legal argument he makes for his prior claim to ownership of the island is written in the language of law, right? Now, that is how Shakespeare has assimilated his knowledge of the law in the dialogues of a character. And according to Crane, that would be permissible. But making Shakespeare's knowledge of the law a subject of study outside of the play, not so much. I hope that clarifies.
Good. So what concerned me about Ransom's statement here is that a writer's education can inform and impact the work, which can affect how it may be read, just like an author's experiences can impact it. Good, but remember, he has already excluded the impact, right? You cannot write about a poem if you keep in mind the first exclusion, and that is personal registrations. So you cannot say the author knew the law and infused it within the text because of which I feel that Caliban is being legally and morally wronged because that would not be permissible. So see, what I'm trying to highlight is that this part four, I mean, it sounds so simplistic, right? But this is kind of the bedrock of new criticism. If we elaborate these things, so what is happening here? He's trying to do certain things with these injunctions, if I could call them that. First of all, he's trying to create a method which is objective, right? Which means that if it is objective, it can be scientific. It will become scientific in another way, and that is repeatability. If everyone kept these injunctions in mind, chances are we will become incorporated because you wouldn't be doing it, I wouldn't be doing it, and Professor X over there wouldn't be doing it. So these injunctions are, or these exclusions are crucial, right? Because one, you do one and you tell yourself, well, I could do this, but the other one contradicts it. Say, no, you can't do that, right? So that's an interesting thing to keep in mind. But what it then is giving us is an approach towards objectivity, which is crucial in new criticism. Um, scientificity, its repeatability and its way of approaching the object of study with a clear method, which then gives us a method, right? Uh, a tentative method, right? And repeatability, because if we follow these instructions and apply it, and then further details come in part five, is, is we already know that scholarship uh, criticism has to be public. It cannot be private aesthetic experience, right? And so then that knowledge becomes public. Also, these exclusion, exclusions are also creating English literary criticism as a specific field, scientific mode of study. That's why philosophy is excluded. That's why he's saying, don't do historical studies. Don't go outside, don't abstract something historical or technical from a text about the author or about the times in which it, and, and make a body of work out of it. No, stay on the text, right? So in the end then, we are constantly engaged with the text, how it is put together, right? Because that is the object of the study. Let me see any. Yes. So, I mean, when we go and read uh, uh, Beardsley and uh, what's the other guy's name uh, on uh, effective and intentional policies, uh, this is what it is built on. The first exception, personal. Yeah, well, that would be it. And the Cleanth Brooks essay that we'll be reading next is our response to page 911, where Ransom himself is talking about immediate paraphrase. And that's where Clint Brooks comes in and writes the heresy of paraphrase. He's actually responding to John Crow Ransom. His well, criticism of the romantics is not a, as much, it's for their escapism from the reality, but also that they make the act of writing poetry and writing about poetry a private affair, right? And for him, for Ransom, criticism has to be part of the public debate, okay? Because private, our aesthetic experiences are private. They are informed by, in his view, our private identities, right? And what he's saying is when criticism becomes incorporated, it must be public, right? And when it, appreciation can be private, but criticism must be public. And when it is public, 
then it must have a system. And that's the system that he's trying. Uh, yes, obviously. Kant, before that, Aristotle, Neo-Aristotelians. Um, all right, next, going on to page five. That's why I, I, I encourage you to read these brief essays very carefully. These are the foundational essays of American new criticism, right? Once you get these, here is the deal. As you read them and carefully understand them, you will anticipate what a new critic would or would not do. You won't have to read all their works. If they are new critics, you will anticipate it. And that's the purpose of this course, right? As I mentioned in our first class, is not to give you here are the 12 bullet points of new criticism. Here is a reader in which they explain what new. No, what I'm trying to encourage you to learn with me, and I'm learning with you, is as we read Eagleton, we know the debates, right? How are they formulated? What are the material and ideological causes for them? But when we go and read these people, we then learn how how these things, the, how these guys are explaining these things. Let me go to Tommy. Are those kind of peripheral external studies like Shakespeare's understanding of the law even common anymore? Uh, oh, yes, actually, um, more and more because we have moved on to different kind of studies. So now uh, if you go into neo historicism, right? Uh, where the emphasis is not on larger histories, right, but on specific histories. So now we go and unearth certain historical facts that were pertinent at that time, but lost in the larger history. And then we can go and claim, here is what was happening in the Jacobean court at this time. This is when this play was staged. So if we read it within the context of that, the play can mean this thing, the play can mean this thing, right? Stephen Greenblatt, of course, is probably the only one on this planet who can do neo-historicism better. But yes, it is very much in vogue. Even in our study, post-colonialism and everywhere else, you know, we, we now go and say, okay, no, uh, here are the silenced histories of that time. So our understanding of this text would be different if we understood who else was writing at that time, who else could have influenced the author. So I would say what he would consider peripherals is now kind of the dominant mode of scholarship. Marxism has come back, right, to reclaim the text. So has feminism and then feminist Marxism, materialism, historicism, right? Uh, and what the interdisciplinarity that he is worried about here. Remember, these guys are trying to establish the English departments as sovereign, right? As capable of doing specialized work. We have come full circle from there where we now encourage interdisciplinarity. Where if you, it would be a very uh, old fashioned idea to insist that we are hermetically sealed from other disciplines and English studies must just focus on English studies. Uh, you will encounter some people like that in the academia, but yeah, no one wants to study with them though. Uh, Okay, Caitlin, it seems that this subjective treatment of literature relies on the critic ignoring their own political power and privilege while simultaneously ignoring the artists. Absolutely. Um, it goes without saying that what he's claiming, what he's saying, we should be objective. We know in hindsight that we are all always entrenched in a given ideology. And, and we also know that to be a critic is already a privileged position. In their times, it was also a white male position, right? It goes without saying that we are at a time now, uh, thanks to the production of knowledges in social sciences, psychology, psychiatry, and everything else, we know that being objective is almost impossible, right? Because in the end, we express not we don't reflect the reality in our writing, but we express who we are. 
right? And no matter how objectively we do it, there is no way of detaching our emotion, emotional self from that work, right? So that goes without, uh, <laughs> without saying. Okay, I am going to go to page 9, 10, right? Because there are a few other things that he's setting up over here. So in the second paragraph on page 10 is his critique of reviews. I do not suppose the reviewing of books can be reformed in the sense of being turned into pure criticism. The motives of the reviewers are as much mixed as the performance. And indeed, they condition the mixed performance. The reviewer has a job of presentation and interpretation as well as criticism. The most we can ask of him is that he know when the criticism begins and that he make it as clean and definitive as his business permits. To what authority may he turn the critic? I know of no authority. For the present, each critic must be his own authority. But I know of one large class of studies which is certainly critical and necessary, and I can su suggest another sort of study for the critic's consideration if he is really ambitious. Studies in the technique of the art belong to criticism, certainly. So what he's saying is, okay, reviewers, okay, they have a public function, they must write a certain way, but if you want a technique, then that technique, what could be purely criticism, is the studies in the technique of the art itself. So that then brings us the work of art as an object of study. And if you are a critic, your job is to study that me the mechanics of it, right? right. Um, okay, so then he gives, he's like, uh, the, the, that reference to aesthetic distance is a dig at T.S. Eliot, right? But he then, the last part of this essay is really crucial because he's trying to give us a tentative technique. And there, is, there are a couple of slippages here that become part of Clint Brooks' response. But he's saying, at the bottom of page 9, 10, what he's saying is, okay, a device with a purpose. The superior critic is not content with the compilation of the separate devices. They suggest to him a much more general question. The critic speculates on why poetry through its devices is at such pains to dissociate itself from prose at all. And what it is trying to represent that cannot be represented by prose. That's the question. Okay. Why does poetry exist? Right, and he says he says, okay, let's take this question and see is there a method in which we can answer this question? And this is he says, this is my own idea. I intrude here with an idea of my own, which may serve as a starting point of discussion. Poetry distinguishes itself from prose on the technical side by the devices which are precisely its means of escaping from prose. There is some formalistic influence there. So first of all, he's saying, okay, I would like to suggest that poetry is poetry because it uses certain specific devices to escape its proseness. If we study that, we are doing criticism. The critic should regard the poem as nothing short of a desperate ontological or metaphysical maneuver. Why? Because the poem is trying to escape from being prose. In order to do that, it must have certain techniques, certain things, certain props that make that possible. The poet himself in the agony of composition has something like his sense of his labors. The poet perpetuates in his poem an order of existence, which in actual life is constantly crumbling beneath his touch. So this is that hint. Even though he has criticized the romantics earlier, right? That it is in the body of a poem. 
that we will find through these devices something that is complete, right? In which all the parts must work. So a good poem is in which there are certain devices that are used. And then those devices work in harmony with each other to constitute the whole. Now think of it, all that new critics do after this, this paragraph is crucial in understanding that. What are they doing? Stay on the page of a poem, right? Good. What are the tensions that are built because of the meter, because of the rhythm, because of the words that are there? Is this tension that rises in line one, is it resolved here? If you go to William Empson, then he was like, what kinds of ambiguities do exist in this poem? Are those ambiguities resolved? All of those vocabularies are developed from here, right? From this assertion that the poem is a, pro is a work of prose escaping from itself. And in order to do that, it needs those crutches. And those crutches are the devices that make it a poem, right? Kind of confusing. But Next, on page 911, is his discussion of the prose object or the core object. Now, my rough understanding of it, and I'm no expert in these things. Come on, this is my fifth language, English. I didn't even study it. Uh, I'll come back to your question, Kendra, in a minute. It's not showing over here. But let me finish this, and then we'll delve into the question. So on page 911, he says, the critic should find in the poem a total poetic or individual object which tends to be universalized but is, is not permitted to suffer this fate. His identification of the poetic object is in terms of the universal or commonplace object to which it tends and of the tissue or totality of connotation which holds it secure. How does he make out the universal object? It is the prose object, which any forthright prosy reader can discover to him by an immediate paraphrase. It is a kind of story, character, thing, scene, or moral principle. And where is the tissue that keeps it from coming out of the poetic object? That is, for the laws of the prose logic, it's superfluity. And I think I would even say it's irrelevant irrelevance. So at the core of every poem is a prose object. Love, loss, right? Longing, right? Which could have been expressed in the poem. What the poem is trying to do is build around it. So what he's saying is that a critic must make an immediate paraphrase of the poem so that the poem renders its prose object, which is that prose object that has been transformed into a poem. This line, immediate paraphrase, is what Cleanth Brook's heresy of paraphrase is responding to. Because what he's saying is, if, and we'll read it, of course, that if you make a paraphrase out of a poem to find the prose object, you have created a new object. You're not studying the poem, you're studying your paraphrase, which is not the poem itself. But now when you read Cleanth Brooks, you will understand where is he coming from, right? This gives us an idea. Okay, next, uh, I'm gonna go to the last paragraph, read it, talk about it a little, and then I'll get to your questions. Isn't this exciting? Just kidding. The language that I've used may sound uh, okay. so. So he also calls it a prose object, a core object. Um, the language I have used may sound too formidable, but I seem to find that a profound criticism generally works by some such considerations. However, the critics may spell them in the two terms. The two terms are in, in his mind, the prose core to which he can violently reduce the total object and the differentia, residue or tissue which keeps the object poetical or entire. The character of the poem resides for the good critic in its way of exhibiting the residuary quality of the prose object that has been transformed. The character of the poem Poem, poet is defined by the kind of prose object to which his interest evidently attaches, plus his way of involving it firmly in the residuary tissue. 
And doubtless, incidentally, the wise critic can often read behind the poet's public character, his private history as a man with a weakness for lapsing into some special form of prosy or scientific bondage. Similar considerations hold, I think, for the critique of fiction or for the non-literary arts. I remark this for the benefit of philosophers who believe with propriety that arts are fundamentally one, but I would prefer to leave the documentation to those who are better qualified. Okay, let me give you an aside on this concept of the prose object or the core object. And it comes later, but not necessarily later, because the formalists are already writing. And even though structuralism has not come yet, there are people working on folk tales and all. So on that wonderful YouTube channel, there are these lectures on narratology, right? And when narratology is, uh, when some like, people like George Genet and others, when they try to define narrative structures, they give us three things that make a narrative, right? The first is the text that is in front of us, the poem. The second is the story. The story is the arrangement of events, plot, foreshadowing, everything else within that text. And at the core is what they call the fabula, right? Now, fabula are the stories in their unjumbled form, the raw story. So for narratologists then, studying a narrative then is to figure out what is its fabula. Then in the story, how is the fabula arranged? And then in a text, how it is, how is it represented. The idea is, since the narratologists read the structures of the stories, right, the idea is to come to it vertically to see layer upon layer. Here is the text. This is the story. Here is its fabula. So if you read Vladimir Prop, right, uh, his famous pamphlet called Morphology of a Tale, which we will probably read if we have time. So he is studying the fabula structure of the stories because he goes and collects 3,000 folk tales. Those are stories, when told, they are arranged in a story form, but they have core elements, right? The fabula, unarranged. And based on that, he defines the whole structure, morphology of a tale, right? This is kind of on the same line, is, is that first defining a poem as something that is trying to escape from being prose. In order to do that, it needs certain mechanics, certain techniques, right? And then in the process of doing that, it must hide the prose element that constituted it, right? But the residual impact of that prose core will display itself in the poem. So what he's saying is the role of the critic is to account for these things, right? When you read the new critics, do I have one of them here, um, especially Cleant Brooks' book, this is not some suggestions in here. This is not Masood Raja writing his article and publishing it that no one reads. This essay and his book will then launch practices that people actually, you know, take and which becomes the dominant mode of doing literary criticism in United States, right? Not dislodged until mid 70s or 1980s. And in certain departments that I know of and certain people, it hasn't been dislodged yet. Okay, so Tommy, not really subsumed. I would say that it has been appropriated. Certain approaches, of course, have broken through it, right? Uh, that primacy of the text kind of thing. But certain approaches have further reformed it, especially if you read Derrida. I mean, the most significant technique that new critics develop is the technique of close reading. Close reading a text 
without referring to its context, without referring to the authorial intention. That has endured over, you can read Federici's book on Marxism and feminism. You can read Marx himself, who might have not read New Critics, but they all perform close readings of the text. Well, may it be so that has endured. And Derrida's deconstruction of the text is obviously a more sophisticated form of close reading, right? Uh, but yeah, some of the practices have endured. And then what happens with new critics is, as you will see, is that since they are talking about this detailed study of the text itself, right? The problem is it can only be applied to, you know, lyrical poems. So then poetry becomes the default genre about which you do criticism. Because I mean, imagine picking up infinite jest, right? And writing a new critical book on it. I mean, it will take you years to do that. So that even narrative poems become hard to write about with this kind of new critical approach. But yes, poetry was considered, I don't know, more natural or something. Kendra, is Ransom setting up a paradox by saying that universities should be teaching this technique, but then countering by saying that each critic must be their own authority? No, not really. What he's saying is, when he goes to that point, to what authority? What he's saying is that there is no system to which they can refer to at this time. And that's why he is then giving us this tentative explanation of what it could be. So the idea is that if we develop this technique, here are some tentative ideas, then the critic will have a body of knowledge, a systematic way of reading text to rely on and to define his or her own way of doing things. Yes, I think when he says the prose object, he, without even acknowledging it, he's talking about that anything that could have been written in prose or said in prose becomes part of transformation into the poetry because of obviously he knows that we think in prose, right? But why do poetry? Poetry is a stylized way of rendering prose through devices, right? But that prose content is always there. That's what he seems to suggest. And it's hidden because it's the core that he's talking about. So what he's not saying is that prose is out there by itself. What he's relying on, I think, is that Poetry is a specialized way of rendering thought and ideas. And it has a prose core, right? But the poet, through these devices, renders it in poetry. There was something else that was coming to my mind on this question, the question of prose object. But I'll come back to it later. OK. Um, so it's like, uh, yeah, we are at one hour and 10 minutes already. Think of it. So here is, I'm going to stop here and I will edit this and make it available to you because I think it was a good discussion today. But here is what uh, you should keep in mind. These essays that we are reading, we have already learned that every line, every paragraph here is dense and, and loaded. And the best way to learn it, of course, is by reading it really carefully, not making any assumptions at one point, because it might not be the point, right? And then we will go and move beyond that. Now, that's all I have on John Crow Ransom. Now, please do keep in mind, this is one of the most important essays 
in the history of American criticism, but especially for new criticism. And it would be also interesting to go and look up his references, people that he is referring to, and see what they wrote and what they published, right? And that would be even a more expensive reading of this text. But that is all. I hope this has been uh, clarified and you somewhat understand it. I mean, if not, you know, send me your questions and let me know what you what you want me to explain more, and I'll absolutely do that. But that's all I have on ransom today. Goodbye, Hudafiz, Sayonara, Dhaniawad, and all the other languages. Satsariyakal.